In most areas of my life, I tend to be more of a fly by the seat of my pants kind of person. But when it comes to art, I become a chronic overthinker. Now this wasn't always the case for me. Believe it or not, I used to be able to pick a color to paint with just because I thought it looked pretty and I could draw a room without overanalyzing every single rule of perspective. Shocking, I know. I was such a daredevil. But the funny thing is, I actually really enjoyed the creative process during that time. Even though I didn't fully understand the fundamentals or have the greatest technique, I enjoyed creating and I liked what I made. I was really proud of my work and I found a lot of peace in the process of creating. Now I don't know exactly when my mindset shifted, what caused me to go from carefree and playful to absolutely crippled by fear and overly cautious about every single artistic decision. Somewhere along the way, I became obsessive about doing art right. Now what does right mean? That's a great question, um, heck if I know. <laughs> it is an ever-changing abstract concept in my mind which makes it highly unachievable. Literally, I'm setting myself up to fail at everything I make. But at some point, this shift happened, and art has become less of an enjoyable experience and more of, dare I say, a burden. Now, I am fully aware that I sound like the biggest hypocrite right now. If you've watched literally any of my other videos, you know I'm always babbling on about how you should make art for the joy of it and not be afraid to fail and make mistakes. Now, here's the thing about me. <laughs> I love giving out art advice, but I'm not always so keen on following it. A big character flaw of mine, for sure. But regardless of what brought me to this headspace, I've become much more focused on things being right than on things being art. And I do think there's a difference. Something can be technically good in terms of perspective or color theory or anatomy, but totally lifeless in terms of story and beauty and personal expression. Now don't hear me say that learning the fundamentals and having those skill sets is a bad thing. Really understanding the fundamentals can take your work to a whole new level. But I genuinely believe that if your heart isn't in what you're making, it's not art. Spicy take, I know. But I think the heart behind your work is what matters the most. The magic needs to come before the method. So one of my biggest goals for this year is to sort of heal my relationship with my art. To be more playful with it, to not be afraid to try new things and to be bad at them, or to try old things for that matter and be bad at those too. <laughs> I've been trying to spend more time in my sketchbooks just doing low pressure, messy spreads. I also set the goal of creating 20 original illustrations for this year. Coming off of the 100 scene studies challenge at the end of last year was a very big game changer for me. I had learned so much about the fundamentals, about drawing and painting, so, so many different subjects. I'd learned so much about color mixing and painting techniques, painting in so many different styles, but I'd spent almost the whole year on copying other people's work, or painting all of those scenes from movies and TV shows. I'd kind of forgotten how to use my own imagination and create my own work. I still did several personal illustrations last year, but my primary focus was definitely the scene studies challenge. Now, do I regret the challenge? Absolutely not. I really do think it was a great way for me to learn. But I think the way that I went about doing it and the intensity that I put on the challenge might have done a little bit more harm than good in some ways, arguably. <laughs> so going into this year, I was in a, a bit of an artist identity crisis. I had kind of drowned out my own artistic voice by focusing so much on learning technique and fundamentals. I didn't even know what I liked anymore. I didn't know what colors I wanted to use or what subjects I wanted to paint. Because I'd relied so heavily on painting from a reference for so long, the blank page was absolutely crippling to me. So setting the goal of using the 20 themes from the scene studies challenge has kind of been my way of pushing myself to reconnect with my own imagination. It gives me a prompt so I'm not just sitting there with no sense of direction. I have plenty of room to interpret a prompt in whatever way I want while still having a little bit of a goal in mind. I think it's really important to remember that giving yourself space to create doesn't mean not giving yourself some limitations. I think the idea of art rules and limitations is kind of a pendulum. On one side of the pendulum swing, you have anarchy, 
complete and total lack of regard for any art rule, free reign of any supply, no time limits, a complete blue skies mindset. Now on the other swing, you have artistic dictatorship, rigid following of every single rule and no room for experimentation or your own individual voice. I don't personally believe that true art is found at the climax of either swing. I think it's anywhere else in the middle. Now it doesn't have to be a 50-50 balance, but I do think you need a bit of both to make true art. There needs to be some freedom and some structure, because a blue sky approach can be just as creatively stifling as exact obedience of every single rule. So for this illustration, the theme was creatures. Now I definitely knew starting out that I wanted to include a dragon to hit the creatures prompt, and I also knew that I of course wanted to make it cozy. If you watched my last sketchbook tour video, you'll know I've been sketching a lot of dragons in cardigans this year, and I thought that'd be a fun idea to explore for this theme. The campfire idea was actually based on an old sketch that did not include a dragon, but I've always really liked the original sketch and hadn't had a chance to paint it yet, so I thought if I combine the dragon with the campfire drawing, it's two birds with one stone. <laughs> I complete the prompt and get to paint something that I'd already been wanting to paint. I do think I'm beginning to master the art of manipulating these prompts for the illustrations to fit my own nefarious purposes. Let's just call it following my artistic voice. Now today's video doesn't have a sponsor, so instead I am shamelessly giving myself a 20 second shout out. I'm currently trying to move out the last of my older products to make ways for some really fun new prints and stickers, so if you're interested in grabbing a couple items, you can head on over to my Etsy shop for a little Christmas in July shopping spree. Now back to our art chat. So with each new illustration, I think I'm beginning to hone in a little bit more on my own process for creating. Finding what works for me and what doesn't. There are a lot of things that don't, let me tell you. So I've been incorporating more digital work into my planning phase, which has kind of been a game changer. I still tend to do my thumbnail sketching in a regular old sketchbook, but using Krita to clean up my sketch digitally and move things around helps me save a little bit of time not having to erase everything when I want to add something new or take something out. I've also been taking the time to create a value and color key instead of just jumping straight into the painting. This really helps me hone in on the direction I want to take a piece in. I can create a hierarchy with value and color and really establish those basic building blocks early on in the process to help me tell the story that I want to tell for the prompt. Solving those bigger problems early on through the keys really helps me to just loosen up during the actual painting process and enjoy painting. Another way I've been trying to lower the pressure during the painting process is by trying to follow my knock out the light of the paper advice. Shocker, it really does help. <laughs> Even if I don't hit the colors and values exactly in the first pass, it gives me a little bit of a base to work off of. Like I talked about in my video on color theory, both color and value are relative to what's around them. So getting as much of the white of the paper knocked out in the first pass as I can gives me a lot more information to follow for the second pass. Now this illustration definitely reminded me just how uncomfortable I am with painting people. You'd think I'd be used to it by now, but no. That's just not the case. I don't have a great grasp on painting skin with gouache. Put markers in my hand and it's not a problem, but for some reason I get really in my head about painting skin with gouache. That's probably a sign that I should practice it more. <laughs> but we'll see if that actually happens. So I ended up leaving the girl alone for a while due to frustration. <laughs> I bounced around to other parts of the painting to let myself cool off a little bit about it. I can honestly say the pair of high tops is probably one of my favorite parts of the painting. I think they turned out kind of cute and chunky and I'm always a fan of a good old pair of high tops. Now one of the areas I really tried to embrace a don't think just do mindset for this piece was with the fire. To get the values of flames, I really needed to take advantage of the white of the paper and use my gouache at its fullest saturation. I also wanted that really nice gradient of white heat to crisp scarlety flickers. So I figured using the wet on wet method would be the most effective way to achieve both of those goals. Now wet on wet requires you to be fast and to be focused because you have fairly limited time before your paper dries. I needed to be quick, but I also needed to make each brushstroke count. I had about a 15 minute window to paint before running an errand one day, and I thought, well, let's see if I can get this fire painted before I leave. 
honestly, having that time limit really helped me to just get out of my own head and get the thing done. I didn't have time to overanalyze and nitpick with each brush stroke. I simply needed to trust that internally, I knew what I was doing. And surprisingly, I did. <laughs> and even more than that, I had fun with it. It's amazing how if you just stop overthinking things, you tend to enjoy yourself a little bit more. That said, I did struggle a bit with overthinking the lighting for the wooden log that the characters are sitting on. There were many, many instances of, but is this actually how firelight would look on a fallen tree? I love how I've literally painted a dragon in a frickin' cardigan toasting a marshmallow with his fire breath, but I was concerned about the realism of light on a log. <laughs> Logic. So I went back to repainting the bandana girl many, many times. You know, I just couldn't seem to paint her to my liking for about three quarters of the process. I tried bringing in colored pencils, I tried looking at reference photos, and it just was not coming out the way that I wanted it to. In the end, I do think we got there, um, I'm at least not cringing when I look at her anymore, so you know what? I'm gonna count that as a win. Unfortunately, due to my lack of skill in properly framing a camera shot, I painted most of the fire logs off screen. <laughs> Very disappointing, because that was one of my favorite parts, but it's fine. At least we got some successful footage of the splattering paint technique for the fire sparks and painting the little daddy spotty bits. So one of the quote unquote rules that I have been willfully and joyfully breaking lately is the don't use thin gouache over thick gouache rule. Now I used to be a stickler that you absolutely could not break this rule, but now it's one of my absolute favorite rules to break. Is there risk involved? Yes. Would it raise my cortisol level if I had one? Probably. There's always this chance that you might accidentally reactivate the gouache underneath and smudge your painting, but honestly, if you use a light hand and don't just scrub at your painting, turns out you can do a bit of a glaze over the top to create some really cool effects. You can darken your values, or saturate and desaturate colors, or shift to another color entirely. I glazed the background to darken the value of the forest behind our character. I really wanted to bring more focus to the foreground, and I thought the best way to do that was just to darken the background. Now I did have to go back in and repaint some of the trees that had gotten lost during the glaze, but it was a pretty quick fix, and I think it was definitely worth it. Overall, I think this is one of the illustrations that I've most enjoyed creating this year. I listened to a lot of peaceful Studio Ghibli music, and some very hilarious episodes of the Off Book Musical podcast. This illustration was one that definitely had a bit of a time limit on it since June is a very busy month for me. I don't know what it is about June every year, but I cease to exist as an artist for most of it. Anywho, I think I'm learning that time limits are actually a really good thing for me. They help me to focus in and put more trust in my instincts. It's definitely taken a lot of effort this year to start to find joy in my art again, you know, painting's not always going to be easy, it's not always going to be comfy, but you definitely shouldn't have to just drag yourself through a piece from start to finish. I do still think I have a long way to go with sort of <laughs> healing my relationship with creativity, but I definitely think I've made a lot of progress this year. I'm learning what I like to create, the tools I like creating with, and I'm learning to enjoy the actual creative process again instead of just stressing about it the whole time. <laughs> At the end of the day, there's no point in creating art if you don't love creating art. And I want to love creating art. I do love creating art, but I think that love just kind of got a little bit buried over the last year or so. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed watching me paint this cozy campfire illustration and chatting with me about my journey through artistic identity crisis. If you're interested in learning more about my brainstorming and painting process, check out this chaos to creation video in the card above or in the description below. Huge thank you to my patrons over on Patreon for being such a wonderful support system for me. You guys are the ones that give me the space and the means to create the things that bring me joy. And I will never ever be able to thank you enough for that. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you soon. Bye guys!